But going with the experience um, with the people leaving the department, uh, they have, again, high certifications and a lot of experience. Does, when they leave the department, does that affect patient care or the preparedness of the department? Absolutely not. Uh, I, get, I, I tell you, to, uh, a good example is that uh, the city did a citizen survey. Uh, they did it for that, uh, that over uh, two times I know of over, over the last few years. 88% uh, was the customer satisfaction rating of the department. They had that information, chose not to print it. Yeah, 88%. What that tells us is, is that when you compare all city departments and what the, the citizens of Greenville say, and I'm going to give you a little bit bigger number than that in a minute, 88% of people said they love the services provided by the fire rescue department. And what, what is great for me is that they are willing to pay for those services and provide resources and facilities, 88%. We actually do internal surveys on a daily basis, um, and it varies. Our, uh, our paramedic supervisors go out, and they just go to, it could be a patient, it could be a family member, it could be anybody, and we do customer satisfaction surveys. They're blind, they don't have to put their names on it, and they're able to put it right into a cell phone. Over the last three years, we've got data on 586 uh, people that had did the survey. I know of about three that gave us below satisfied. Most of all of those 586 were very satisfied. And so what we do with that information, if we see somebody that's not satisfied, if they're willing to provide us their name or contact information, a supervisor is going to call them, whether that be Chief Davenport, myself, or Battalion Chief uh, Shannon Sparrow. We're going to call them back, or even the medic one, we'll address it right then, because we want to make sure now, those 586 represent anybody that comes to our community. We, we, don't, we don't care who they are. They could be from another county, another country. They could be from anywhere. We're going to treat them. And one of the things we're going to do is we're going to treat them in a timely manner with a very high-level professional service. And if that service falls below anything that we think is, 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 is great, we want to know because we want to improve. That's, yeah. that's part of what we're doing. We're, we're on a continuous improvement model. And so, I, I haven't seen where people leave and has affected the service. What I can tell you is that we continue to have a, a quick response time. We can continue to provide, I mean. What was the number on the cardiac? Yeah, they, well, that, that's, that's, that's the number that, that's increased. Last year, there were nine uh, cardiac arrests that we uh, saved. And when we mean by saved, we, they were able to leave the hospital, live, walking and breathing. The nine last year, 23 this this past year. I mean, well, nine the year before, 23 last year. Now, let's compare that. Let's compare that. So, on average, about 40% 40, 40 of people who we go to cardiac arrest, uh, they live, they're, when they're, they're, they are breathing when we get them to the hospital. That's cardiac arrest. Let's just talk about overdoses for a minute. You know how I many overdoses in this city? Yeah. Last year, about 292. Now, we've been providing Narcan and, and opioid reversing drugs for many years. 292 overdoses. That's a story. There is a significant number of those folks who are living and breathing. I can just tell you, I just heard uh, two as of yesterday afternoon and first thing this morning. Two, two already, just in that little short period of time, living and breathing because of the services that our folk are providing. Those same folk. You know why? As it goes back to it, I'll keep re reiterating. We believe in training them. We're going to train them. They get a whole lot of experience. So whether they've been here for five minutes or five years, we're gonna make sure we provide them that training from the day they come from the academy or get into the academy till they graduate to right on through, we're gonna provide it. So the service is not gonna drop. Because as we as I said, we're continuously to going to training. We're continuously to look at national trends. So what we know is people are not staying in this field. That's what I said from the uh, International Association of Fire Chiefs Conference. That is the number one problem. So we're going to address it.
Okay. So how is the, the number of individuals leaving the department affecting paramedic or paramedic staffing on ambulances? Uh, it's not affecting paramedic level on, on ambulances because we've changed the model of how we staff our ambulances. Now, we staff our ambulances uh, sometimes with paramedics, sometimes with uh, uh, EMTs. But what we do is we provide a paramedic, paramedic level of service on every single call we respond to. So whether that paramedic comes on an ambulance, whether it comes on a SUV, or whether it comes on a fire truck, or whether it comes in a, a pickup truck, they're going to, every single call is going to have a paramedic on it, and that's what happens. Is there a delay in care between the ambulance getting to the scene and the squad truck getting to the scene? Absolutely not. Most times the, the squad truck, truck is there. But let's just make it clear. Everybody's going to be responding when the tone comes in. People, everybody responds. So whether you're coming from this side of town or that side of town, who knows? I mean, traffic patterns or traffic... Um, delays, uh, time of day, that's lots of things. A train across the track could delay service, could delay some service. But that being said, we have strategically located every one of our stations in this city. We don't just go plop them down. They're, they're located so we can have the quick response times. The other thing is, the majority of the time, a person don't just walk in and start doing paramedic level of service. Mm -hmm. The majority of the time, everybody goes there and get the same thing. It's a basic assessment. A basic assessment that a basic EMT is going to do to start diagnosing what that issue is. Also, also, let's just be clear about something. A paramedic really is doing about 10% more of the skills that a basic EMT can do. And what I mean by that is, it's the high level narcotics. Now why do we give narcotics? Pain is the majority of the things we give narcotics for. There's sometimes we may need to do some type of sedation with, with uh, certain drugs uh, uh, for, for various reasons. All right, so let's just use, uh, let's, let's do a real comparison so it'll be clear for, the, uh, for everybody. A, a cardiac arrest probably one of the more worst events a person has. What's saving people? CPR. Basic EMT skills are saving people. Those, those, those uh, uh, numbers that I just talked about, the 23 people we saved, we didn't save them, save them with paramedic level skills. It was basic level skills. Okay. So, so, so the care I would say is that, that's probably one example where the care is actually probably increasing because when we get better at those basic level skills, yeah, that's what, that's the same. Those 23 people are walking and breathing, not because of paramedic level skills. Well, paramedics really are, like I say, giving narcotics. They're doing some what they call cardioversion with the uh, defibrillators. And I would just say to you, that defibrillator that the paramedic is using is the same one that the basic EMT applied. It's the same machine. Okay. So with the J.H. Rose uh, High School football game on September 4th, uh, there was uh, EMS 8 on standby, it was in between calls. Why did it take seven minutes for a squad truck, or in this case, it was uh, Medic 1 to get to the scene? Let me, let me make sure I get that correct for you. Uh, you said it was on standby um, in between calls. They weren't there. We go to every single high school and junior high school football game with a fire truck, a, an SUV, or an ambulance. The, reason, the reason being, the state of North Carolina says in order to kick off that ball, they need to have medical staff there. So we provide that, and I would say we provide that for free. We provide that service, and it can be anybody. It doesn't have to be, it could be me going out there as a basic MT with two bags. It don't have to be an ambulance there, all right? They're there for medical support. Now, the people who have gave you that information is unfortunate. Did they tell you what that call type was? So, Pitt County Schools say there is a fee associated with providing a, a, an ambulance fire truck at high school football games. That's why they don't ask uh, Green Fire Rescue, for instance, to provide an ambulance. We've, we've always provided that ambulance. Uh, we've always provided that medical support ever since I've been here for almost 25 years. Is it dedicated to the, to the games? No, it doesn't have to be dedicated. They just have to have medical support. Now, go back to the strategically located. We still respond there in a timely manner. 
If you 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 talked uh, a little bit about 1710. What does 1710 say about ALS uh, support on the scene? Eight minutes to the scene, right? You just said we got there in seven minutes. So are we meeting 1710 by putting that paramedic on, on the scene? And what, what what's interesting about that particular call without going into patient care? It was a traumatic injury that occurred on the field. We actually received an accommodation for that how well we provided service to that person. And a traumatic injury requires them to start off doing basic level uh, um, care, splinting, stopping any bleeding that may be occurring, dressing the wounds. The paramedic is gonna come there to provide additional support and pain medication if needed. It, that, that, that day is no different than today. And I don't know who's on actually on the ambulance out there in the bay, if it's one out there right now or not. But there could be two basic EMTs that drive across the street for a cardiac arrest. And at some point within, that, that most times going to be within that eight minutes, if not quicker, there's going to be a paramedic or a fire truck. There's going to be somebody go over there to support. Okay. And the reason why we do that, we make sure we provide all our personnel support on every single scene. Okay. When an ambulance is staffed with a, an EMT basic or an inter EMT intermediate, are they allowed to go to the call and then transport the individual to the hospital after they, they have stabilized the patient? Yes. Even though Freeman Fire Rescue is a paramedic level service, they don't need a paramedic to sign off on the you patient? Did, you, you didn't let me finish my, my, my statement. Okay. Yes. But as I said before, we're going to put a paramedic on every single scene. Mm -hmm. All right. So with that being said, if an EMT... Uh, two EMTs go to a call. They're going to have that paramedic on the way, and when that paramedic get there, make sure that we provide that assessment to ensure that that patient is getting the highest level of care that we can provide, and that's paramedic level. Then they will transport. Uh, the the very excuse me for my the can when I can talk too much and get dry. Mm -hmm. The the very small number of times that occurred. Is, it's unfortunate that you'd be writing a story on that because out of those 17,000 some odd calls, we've probably known of that sort of that, what well, they're saying a delay, probably somewhere around uh, probably one or two times in a given year. What's interesting about that is, is that we know internally why that is. Uh, those cases would be that people not wanting to have that level of support and supervision on the scene. So we make sure that we put the paramedic there because we're not interested in providing uh, a lower level of care. We want to provide that paramedic level of care. Okay. Because squad, both the squad trucks are tasked with following multiple ambulances, how can they immediately respond to a call if they're assisting another ambulance at that point? They're not required to they're, because if they're assisting another ambulance, we have a fire truck that's, that has a paramedic on. Every one of these fire trucks you see, with the exception of Tower 1, mm -hmm. has a a paramedic staff to it every single day. And as you said, let's use for example, we'll go back. Make too much noise that candy. <laughs> Wilson, Concord, and High Point. You used them. So Concord is uh, Cabarrus County, I believe. Uh, Cabarrus County EMS will provide the uh, paramedic or whatever level of service they're providing in Concord. Wilson County EMS. So if there's a call at the Wilson Fire Rescue Headquarters Station, the fire truck goes as a first responder. Wilson County EMS comes in. Right? So why did Wilson respond with just two EMTs from the fire truck? The same question you're asking me is that they are going there to help out Wilson County EMS. But Wilson County EMS is bringing the paramedics. So the fire truck responds to the call to provide support. The, the Wilson County EMS unit comes in uh, to provide the transport. That model is used everywhere. I don't know who thought that would be a great uh, piece to make a big deal out of. As you, I think that you, uh, and I'm not making this personal, but you talked to Dr. Patella and Dr. March, is that correct? Yes. 
you did not choose to use their comments in your article, in, in this first article. Dr. Patella said to you, that's nothing new. Greenville's doing the same thing they're doing all across the country. I've been parts of the system myself, which we work under Dr. Patella's uh, uh, license. So I know that you're very familiar with the EMS system and the people who are providing you that information are familiar, but you're, it's unfair because we're providing a higher level than the people you com you compared us to. So to, to, to explain, Dr. Patella declined uh, to have an interview with me. I did go see him, but then he declined while I was there. Uh, Dr. March, I had, I had a convert interview with him. Uh, excuse me, it was about a, a different subject than the paramedic and, and that topic. It was EMS deployment. He called and told us mm -hmm. what the conversation was about. He sent us an email. He sent us an email told yeah. us what, what the conversation was. Yeah. And Dr. Dr. Patel has provided the same information. We know that you talked to him about that model, but I, you, you did a comparison with Wilson, Concord, and High Point. What model are they using for EMS response? EMP level. I, I think I think this goes back to one of our, our most significant uh, I'll, I'll just say complaints with how the stories have been written and and when I and this is not against you necessarily Matthew because they have to go up the line somewhere someone has to edit them someone has to approve them before they go out in print there's not context with a lot of this stuff that you're writing you're not really comparing us with other departments, as he's been through numerous times over there, it's, it's, it's not fair to us if you're not going to put this stuff in context with other departments. I mean, if we're, if we're not doing anything different than anyone else in the state, where's the story? Okay. Um, so, a major complaint with uh, firefighters who are on the squad trucks is the amount of calls that the squad trucks see and their concern is sleep deprivation because they don't have time to, to eat or to sleep or to, to take care of themselves. How has the Greenville Fire Rescue addressed that concern? So, I, I, another great question. I wish you had a call or came by and talked to us before you printed that because that's an incorrect statement. Uh, the, we do what we call unit hour utilization studies uh, on a monthly basis. When we put those squads in, church, in service, we started really looking at it and ensure that the unit hour utilization uh, stayed in the optimal level. Uh, if you look at a lot of the data that's been put out there, uh, if you look at, I'll, I'll just use the ICMA study, which uh, was done on the department. Um, you, you had a copy of that, correct? Yes. And did you remember what the unit hour utilization recommendation was from them? I was not provided that part of the survey. Yeah, so they, they recommended uh, 25%. So uh, a lot of the national models look at 33%, and we've been using 33% for a long time. Uh, and basically the difference is is that it's either you want to work uh, one sixth of your day or one quarter of your day. Uh, so it's just a couple hours different. So let's just use, let's just break down you with our utilization for a minute. So you look at uh, how many hours a person is committed to working on their particular assignment. So uh, one sixth of the day is what the recommended, recommended time is. And the other part of your day, you're able to sleep, uh, rest, uh, uh, and train. And so I use Brock, for example. Brock, you work one day uh, for eight hours a day, right? <laughs> it's not one. On a good day. <laughs> so a firefighter works one day for 24 hours. And the city and the national model has been so compelled to ensure that the firefighters had time to rest, have breaks and everything. They said that 24 hour day, you only, we only gonna be looking at you working about one six of, so about six hours a day. Mm -hmm. All right, so I can provide that data for you because we do it all the time. Uh, the squads, uh, squad one and squad two, and they're really close when you come percentage-wise. They're about 27% uh, utilization. Okay. Uh, and, and, and so EMS two, EMS two uh, back in 2013 uh, was somewhere around about 38%. 
and we said, you know what, we really we got to get this unit some rest. We've got to find a way to bring down the utilization. What do we do? We put in another EMS unit. So the squad, we started with squad, which what, what is known as squad two. We started with one, and we saw where the utilization was high. We put in squad two, where we're able to provide more support. So right now, if you look at the numbers, I can tell you just from looking at it with uh, just sort of a naked eye without doing the utilization for this month, the numbers are down. So a EMS unit goes on call, one call uh, uh, takes about an hour to turn from the time they leave the station to the time they transport to the hospital to the time they get back. It takes about an hour. A squad is taking about 15 minutes. Our squads are only running somewhere around about, probably on average, about 17 calls a day. Taking about 15 minutes. <clears throat> Do the math. The, the utilization is not there. That, that, that quote you had in there just was so <clears throat> un incorrect. <clears throat> that quote was from an employee that was a former employee that was here that had no earthly idea about the data. All, all they're saying is, oh, it feels like I'm running a lot. Well, I feel like I've talked a lot in this last couple of hours, but I don't know that I've You'll talked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of information. I want to make sure I clear it up because that is sort of, it, it's so incorrect. Uh, and what I will do is to prove that to you, I will let you come for 24 hours and ride those squads and you'll see at the end of the day, well, what was the big deal? Okay. Um, transitioning to uh, the Academy with Peak Community College and Green <coughs> Fire Rescue. On April 5th, 2017, Academy 10 went to Nash Community College to do training. On the way back, they came and they stopped at a gas station uh, to rest, use the bathroom. Two of the cadets at that time uh, went across the street and purchased two alcoholic beverages, according to security footage. Allegedly. Changing. Stop. Have you seen that footage? Yes, we have a copy of the footage. You could see that it was alcoholic beverage? They went to the refrigerated section of that store, got two You could beverages. clearly see that it was an alcoholic <coughs> beverage. It was a Bud Light and a corkscrew cocktail. You you can see it? Yes. Okay. I'd, I'd so love let me to see that. And have let you me answer that? that question for you, because you you That's you're, a it's a personnel issue. Just remember that, though. Yeah, it's a. I'm, I ain't gonna get into the personnel. It's amazing that you would say that. What I will tell you is that we knew about that. We was reported to us about three days after. We got uh, statements and we looked into it. Uh, none of that was substantiated. Then a video was produced, uh, as you said. Uh, and unfortunately, that video doesn't give us any clear indication of anything. We were so concerned, we had experts, and I won't say who the experts are since it is a personal issue. We had experts in that field and said, there's no way we can tell anything. And I know that you know, that video now is out online and people have posted. And I think everybody's probably went there and looked at it and still, even the residential experts, the people who uh, just, we've heard people come, what in the world is that? So it's unfortunate that you would say something like that because I know for a fact, if you saw the same video I saw, there's no way possible as an employer, you can actually say that is clear, evidential uh, information that I can use in a deploy, in an employment decision. And I'm sorry, uh, that 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 people would be willing to make accusations like that uh, without having substantial evidence. Let, let me just let me just say without getting into the personnel. Mm -hmm. You you all have families. Think about think about what you have done to those folks' family and those folks' kids. It is it is very unfortunate. Okay. Matthew, you yourself, and I ain't gonna get personal. You wrote an article right before you started all this writing about diversity and some other things, and I thought it was a pretty good editorial. You have been so in conflict with this story, with that story. It is a, it, if you really think hard about what has been done by by people trying to make something out of that. It is so wrong. The other thing is <clears throat> another untruth that has been put in here is that mm -hmm. related to that situation is that we suspended somebody for eight days. You got that information. 
you know there is nobody in this department that has been suspended for eight days in my 25 year history that I can tell you about <clears throat> for eight days. And in this case, since I've been the fire chief, I know for a fact there ain't been nobody suspended. Let me just tell you the other thing is. For that I think, I, think I can clarify I think I, that there, because since you've been the fire chief, no one has been suspended for that length of time. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Let, let me just say the other thing is that people don't set you up on say your reporting. There's people that know the truth, and you wrote something in there that is absolutely wrong. The people that came that brought this this video attention and all this 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 accusation that brought it three days later was not an employee of the city of Green. Okay. To clarify with the video, what aspect of the video was unclear? Was it the part where they were going to the refrigerated section, or was it the part that they were purchasing? Uh, the refrigerated section, to me, has uh, all types of stuff in it. So it could be uh, soda, energy drinks, it could be anything. I bet, yeah, they went to the refrigerated section, opened the door and got something out. But when we looked at that video, we didn't see clear evidence. And to make employment decisions, you got to have clear evidence. As I said, yeah. we're making we're messing with people's families. We don't we we don't take uh, employment decisions. We don't take disciplinary decisions. We don't take those lightly because we realize that people are going to be people, and we're going to make sure we give them every benefit of the doubt if they're giving us their 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 version. And if people are not substantiating that, I'm not I'm not going to do people wrong for no reason. When the investigation was being conducted into the video, did any um, again respecting the personnel aspect of this, did anyone the investigators go to the store to to see what refrigerated section they went to the beverages in that refrigerated aisle? I think that might be something we need to clarify whether we can comment on or yeah. not. Okay. It's getting into the personnel. Part. Okay. Okay, so now, can there. I ask you, did you go? Yes. You went to the store? Yes, and that is the only, the refrigerated section that they went to, that is the only alcohol in that store, in that one section. At what point were, did you go? During my investigation into the process. How long would it have been after the event? It was right after. How do you know they didn't change things around? I can't, I can't, I, I that's exactly. something. You went right after? During the five-month investigation. Oh, oh, five months. Okay, I'm gonna say you went right after. Because mm -hmm. I mean, you you do understand we we know how the video was produced and where it came from, right? Yeah. Yep. You do understand that, right? And that is public records from your part, right? Yes. So we can obtain those records from you. You can obtain them from the same source I did. Yes. You, but can we obtain the public records from ECU or how you got it? That I don't. I'm I'm not the expert on that question. Do you know? I mean, you do. Do you know we can obtain the public records? Of the video? Of all of this stuff. Where the information came is. from. I mean, some of the information that we received, like that video, um, was from sources that we clarified and we backed up those sources. Mm -hmm. But I guess I'm asking a question. So, ECU, you all are part of ECU, and ECU is subject to North Carolina Public Records uh, information. So the information, all of this information from this can be obtained. Mm -hmm. We're, pro uh, yeah, we're, we're an independent, 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 uh, independent newspaper. But you but received you funds from funds. the university. Um, we were from the student a bit of student activities fees, but we are mostly funded by our advertising. And department. You are most likely subject to the Correct. public information. If you receive and, and any the, kind of we'll and have the advisor, yeah. and the advisor on campus receipt is paid by ECU, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which okay. all right. are are you all provided uh, school email addresses? We probably need to have this conversation with the legal experts yeah. at, the, at, the, yeah. at, the, at the at the college. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have discussion with them. Okay. Clarify that. So moving forward, uh, it was you. Brock mentioned this to me in a correspondence that we have. Greenville Fire Rescue recently started an accounting system to keep track of fire inspections. Why did they start keep start that accounting system now? Well, that you not well recently. Let's clarify recently. Uh, October 2013, mm -hmm. we started doing electronic uh, fire inspections. So before the all fire inspections were done uh, on paper. Okay. And so before it was all electronic, what was the process before? Was it paper, like, as you just mentioned? Oh, paper. Okay. Okay. 
Um, and, and so going back to uh, the football games and all of that, in the past, according to, to Pitt County, Pitt County EMS, uh, Greenville Fire Rescue has requested assistance from Pitt County EMS to serve at football games. Why has that changed this year? So let's just make sure we're clear on that. Yeah. You say it's the only Pitt County EMS or for EMS agencies? Pitt County EMS. Okay, are you ask, I know, but are you asking the question about only Pitt County EMS or EMS agencies? In this example, it would be Pitt County EMS. Okay, so we have used Pitt County EMS in uh, some of the football game staffing. Now, let's just be clear. Maybe, and I maybe need to ask you this question. Who do you think is Pitt County EMS? Or maybe, let me tell me how many stations or units does Pitt County EMS have? Go ahead. Now, are you, I mean, I'm... Well, I'm not here to answer the question. I, I think they've sidetracked you again. That's I think I'm he's trying. asking for clarification yeah. on what you mean when you say Pitt County EMS. I mean the which, EMS provider. So Pitt County EMS only has two EMS stations, and that's Bethel and Pactotals. They staff their units with two people per truck. They only have one frontline truck at each station. Okay. So you're asking... You were, you were asking us to utilize a, a truck from Bethel or EMS so they would be uncovered in their areas. That I guess that's what maybe y'all asked. Well, I'm asking why in previous years, so we, why so it's I, changed. I tell you, so we've used Pitt County EMS, we've used Vanceboro EMS, we've used Edgecombe EMS, we've used Private EMS, we've used a very variety of different EMS providers at uh, the ECU game to support uh, us. Well, let, 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 let's be clear because I know what you're trying to get to. Isn't that the same approach police take? Yeah, oh yeah, they use, they, yeah, the police use all kinds of folk out there. So let's just be clear. And it's unfortunate that you will be sidetracked again, but I guess uh, the, the people who tell you this, uh, I think we know their names, uh, but we won't call names. They, they, they misled you. One of those people who provided you that information was there at the game acting as AMS provider. What's interesting is you chose to get the IEP. You had the IEP, is that correct? Yes. The incident action plan. Yes. You saw the medical plan. Yes. Why did you leave out the doctors that were there on, at the game? Well, I don't provide names and articles. I, I avoid that. Okay, you you did you left yeah, out you left out e East Care, which is a pro EMS provider from the hospital. Is that correct? Okay. But you you I'm just asking. Yes. Yeah. And you left out violent emergency physicians who were on that IEP, is that correct? So you, 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 you're trying to write a story about two units. I think the people of Bethel and the people of Pac Totals would be concerned if we said, hey, send your frontline truck over here to uh, provide EMS at the game. Let me just tell you, Matthew, the real story behind this. I'm sorry, I wish you had came again and, and came and asked. I'll let you come at the game and see this model. We have been doing some things at the game that we wanted to uh, improve on. All right, so it used to be we have EMS trucks on at least four corners of the stadium mm -hmm. and a dedicated unit on the field. So it took more EMS units to have coverage for the city as well as have coverage for whether it's the, and I say coverage for the county because understand, when we get really busy in the city, we have mutual aid. That means we have to bring county units in. So if we bring, if we overtax the city by put, putting too many of our EMS units at the game, we're going to be putting pressure on the county units as well. So we've been trying to trying to model model trying to manage that model, and so thereby reducing the impact on the overall system. When I say overall system, I'm talking about the whole county. Okay. Here's the deal. We have been developing a model at the game that improves patient care, reduces emergency room visits, and ensures that the, the, the families can stay connected. Uh, so how we're doing that? So years ago, we put four EMS units on each corner of the, of the stadium, and then we put a delicate field unit. And then we had some other supplemental personnel help. This year, we went away from that model because we worked with ECU, uh, we worked with violent emergency uh, physicians, uh, emergency room physicians, and we also worked with ECU. Mm -hmm. And what we did is ECU has uh, provided 
a, a room where basically it's a makeshift hospital yeah. where they refurbished, has about seven beds in there. Uh, and then on the other side of the stadium, we've provided what we call our MSU, it was a mobile emergency uh, room trailer that was uh, as a state uh, was provided by the state. Well, basically it's a mini hospital that has beds and air conditioning. And what we're doing now is instead of having putting all the people who are treated at the game and put them in the ambulance and go emergency traffic sometimes out of the stadium, making the public less safe, we have providing that care right there on scene. So what happens? We get the call, our personnel go out, they get the person from the stands or wherever they may be on that on the facility, uh, and we bring them to that emergency hospital. The doctors start an IV, uh, they check the heart rates, they do an assessment, they provide the, the, the care right there. Mm -hmm. What has occurred? We're no longer having to transport a large number of people to the hospital, thereby reducing emergency room uh, visits, thereby keeping the families right there together, thereby making the whole community safer. So if we take the people from the football game and clog up the emergency room, what do you think happens to the public in general? It causes a problem. You go over there to the hospital and you wait hours to get cared. I did we're, it last night. Yeah, we're caring for them right there with the same number of people in general. It's just the different makeup. And, Instead and, of you, and really and truthfully, it, it, it's a, an increased benefit to the family because then they're not incurred with a bill for transport to the emergency room and an emergency room bill, which can be tens of thousands of dollars. So, so folks going to the ECU game, whether it be alumni, whether it be students, whether it be their family members going to the game, they're getting a much higher level service and it's basically free. And it's, and it's just like that within a snap. It's not waiting in those long lines. Let me give you an example. Another very unfortunate time in the way you wrote that article. At that game, there was a very uh, high acuity call. It was a potential stroke. Mm -hmm. We got the person, we diagnosed that it was a potential stroke, we put the person in the ambulance, we transported to the hospital, that person was in the stroke lab, just in a snap. And we got an accommodation again for it. The, the family was very appreciative. But two days later, you write this thing saying we're not providing care. Okay. It would have been great for you to come over to find out how many patients we saw that day, how well that system works, how quickly it is. Maybe, maybe, maybe get a chance to interview some of the folk uh, that, uh, that, that were treated. I know that, that's a, that we can't do no part of that, but you will see it coming out. You're going to see that story coming out pretty soon that how well of a service we're providing. A very high level service and we're not burdening Pitt County EMS. Remember, Pitt County EMS, it's part of an overall system. Okay. Since um, it's one, one more, I'm sorry, Matthew, yeah. one more note on that. Um, I, I think it's worth noting for everybody who's here, uh, just in case you don't know, that I had a meeting with J.J. McGlam last Friday. He expressed a lot of concern about the fact that he was interviewed for that story about East Carolina football games and clearly stated that he was completely satisfied with the level of service being provided by Greenville Fire Rescue and it was not used in the story. We didn't interview JJ McClung. He called, we Matthew him. called him. I didn't, no, I did you not call JJ McClung or McClung. What about Bill Coke? I have interviewed Bill Coke on different occasions, yes. Did you use him in that article, all the stuff that he said? I can't remember off the top you, of my head. You, you did. Okay. You didn't. You, you. I don't understand that you're, you're, you're. And Chris just, Sutton as, as well. Yeah, you're leaving out information that you, you're trying to make that story about Pitt County EMS, but I think it'd just be fair to tell the, the public what Pitt County EMS is. The idea tell is, them who it is present both sides. Let the reader decide for themselves. Don't spin it to meet an agenda. Yeah, let Pitt, let let the let the the, the residents of Bethel and Pactolos know that they don't have an EMS unit in their area because they need to go to the game. That, tell them that part. And, and then, I mean, you're making us look like the villain when we're sitting there saying, this doesn't make sense. We need to look out for the entire system. And when I, when I say that, I know that Greenville requires a lot of EMS service. Y'all know how many times we go out per day on total runs? It averages about 150 times. We are new. We don't sit around just waiting for things. We are out there responding in the community, about 150 total runs a day on average. 
we can't allow ourselves to get blinded and then cause pressure on the county system, on the volunteers. Uh, we don't do that. We look at the whole system. Okay.